it's not the first thing I do, I leave the room as soon as I'm introduced. <laughs> I wasn't thinking that this room did not have uh, shades, and so I did this whole thing on a Lenten theme, you know, so with purple, I'm trying to get as much contrast as I can. Thanks for the, the wonderful introduction. Let me ruin it. Um, why me? I mean, I've been coming uh, a lot of times to shoot, a lot of times just out of interest to the Catholic Medical Association, and I've heard these world-renowned experts presenting on all kinds of topics. And you know, we've got people in this room who've presented on just wonderful deep topics. And you know, Tim says, well, why don't you do it? And I'm thinking, why me? Um, it's true, I do have a PhD in instructional design, um, which is in the school of educational psychology. So if you can be any farther away from a true psychologist and still be in the same room, that's me. Okay, because I'm in instructional design, which is part of educational psychology, which is kind of a distant cousin to real psychology. But um, so I might get to stay just because of that. But um, the real reason I'm here, I think, is I'm passionate about joy, and I'm passionate about um, learning, and I'm passionate about putting those two together, and just the the efficacy of having joy as a component of learning and as a component of life. Um, and also because um, joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. And um, I didn't always used to be this way. In fact, uh, my youngest, youngest daughter still hasn't caught the, uh, the fever I have. And she said, you know, Dad, I really wish you weren't so crabby. Um, <laughs> because I think there's a lot of unlearning she's going to need to do. Because I wasn't always a joyful person. Uh, I was a very um, results-oriented person, and I think I, I stepped on a lot of things that I wish I hadn't in doing that. But I think about four or five years ago, I just really got on fire with just the power of joy in our lives. And so that's kind of what I want to share with you today. Um, and then there's also that homily. Um, so Gaudete Sunday, and uh, we know that Gaudete comes from the entrance anathon, rejoice. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And so I was due to preach on that Sunday. And one of the, the beauties of being a, a deacon in, in at least our parish is you preach once a month. So you have like a whole month to kind of figure out what you're going to say. And so, you know, I'd read the readings and, and this was Gaudete Sunday. It was rejoice, rejoice. And then the first reading was all about the glory of God and, you know, people who are blind are seeing, people who are lame are walking. Wonderful things that's reinforced in the gospel. Um, tell John what you're seeing. Isaiah has come true, and yet every time I read the readings, the only thing I could think of, the thing that stopped me every time, was James' second reading, do not complain. And I, I came home and I, I said to my wife, you know, who's also kind of my, my homily coach, I said, I can't get over this, you know, like there's all these things going on that I should be preaching about, but the only thing that I get stuck on is do not complain. And I think I had some experiences of um, good people, holy people. And you'd come upon them in a conversation and you just hear this, this vitriol, you know, this, oh, yuck, coming from them in the terms of the complaints. And I thought, that's what's motivating this. And then my wife said, well, I just read an article about the health uh, damage you do by complaining. And that kind of sealed it. So I, I, I did a, a homily um, on just how grace builds on nature and then also um, nature can destroy grace and just how dangerous it is to, to lead a life of, of, of complaints. And um, I happened to share that with uh, Devin Schott from the Fathers of St. Joseph just because I'm vain and I like a lot of positive feedback when I do stuff. And he read it and he said, well, my wife's got to read this. <laughs> she needs to hear this. Uh, I, I'm wondering how that conversation went, but um, here, dear, you need to read this. It's about complaining. Um, so he invited me to speak at Fathers of St. Joseph, um, which um, the title of the talk there was Toxic Talk. And um, I shared that with him, and I shared that with the Fathers of St. Joseph. And the same reaction, the, the men there were saying, I got to share this with my wife, except for Tim. <laughs> Tim says, I got to share this with CMA. 
So I'll let him figure out what, <laughs> what he meant by that. Um, but I gave that talk and then that, that garnered this invitation. Let me just give a unabashed commercial for Fathers of St. Joseph for any of the men here. It meets the first and third Wednesdays, um, still the middle of the night, six o'clock in the morning, goes from six to 7.30, so you can get out and still meet your type A personality needs uh, and have a full day's worth of work in St. Mary's in Rock Island. Um, as we talk about what gives us joy, what gives us happiness in a few minutes, um, one of the things we'll learn is relationships. That's why this group is so important. That's why groups like Fathers of St. Joseph, and if someone steps up and, and does a, a complimentary uh, group for women that help them grow in their faith and also their fellowship, um, those things are just hugely important. And uh, I don't know if anybody says, this is the easiest thing in the world for me to do, especially when it's dark out. Um, but certainly, it is well worth doing. Let's define our terms. Okay, if, if we're talking about joy, we're talking about complaining. First, what's joy? Um, Martin Seligman, does anybody know who Martin Seligman is? Now in the 60s and 70s, he was the guy that uh, would shock dogs and came up with this whole idea of learned helplessness, that if you shock a dog and there's no way for him to get away from the shock, even when there becomes a way of getting away from the shock, the dog has learned helplessness. And so that's how he spent his early career, but he has now become one of the fathers of what they call positive psychology. And so he, he defines joy as being pleasure, engagement, and meaning. And he says you have to have all three, that you're not really experiencing joy if it's just pleasure. It's gotta be all three. So that's what he says. What Aristotle says, is it's the human flourishing. It's the joy we feel striving for our potential. Now, I think that's probably something we'd all resonate with here, that, that time that you experience that joy because we're really striving. Now, it doesn't say we've reached that potential. It says we're, we're working towards it. And then there's a, a psychologist, uh, Barbara Fre Fredrickson, and she says it's hard to put in a word. And so she actually gives 10 descriptors for this, this positive feeling we're talking about can be gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, joy, inspiration, awe, or love. And when you get down to joy, inspiration, awe, and love, I know, at least for me, that begins to resonate with the spiritual, that that becomes, you know, part of how I experience God is through that inspiration, joy, awe, and love. Now, if that's what joy is, What's complaining, okay? Complaining is that thing you do to blow off steam with no intention of making anything better, okay? I just need to get this off my chest is kind of what you hear. And um, it's also just making sure the other person knows they're wrong. Um, and so that is, that is um, complaining. Now, I teach leadership courses uh, for business and we did a course and I had 10 different ways of listening, nine of which were great. The one which was not is listening to win. Now don't raise your hands, but has anybody ever been in a conversation where their goal was to listen to win? Looking for that flaw in the argument? Okay. Same thing here. Complaining is just that, I just wanna make sure you know that I know that you're wrong. But there's also a distinction here. What complaining is not. Okay, complaining is not to say what it is for you. You know, that this is how you're making me feel. And I was preparing this talk, I told my sister, I was, I was giving a talk on the, uh, the harms of complaining, the medical harms and, and the, the spiritual harms of complaining. And she said, wait a minute, I gotta share how I'm feeling. You know, and you tell me to shut up when I'm feeling bad, it's just gonna fester. And I said, well, that's not what I'm saying, okay? if if we're really what we're trying to do is we're sharing with people, this is what it's like for me. You know, when you don't call and you're late for dinner, this is what it's like for me. That's not complaining. Especially if you're doing that in the context of sharing what would work for you. If we're oriented towards a solution, it doesn't matter how deeply emotional the conversation becomes. If we're working towards a solution, it's not complaining. Now there's a, an important reason for this, and. and 
Um, there are people in the room who know a lot more about this than I do. I'm just fascinated and interested and willing to share. Now, that's what got me up here this morning. Um, but you've got a battle in your head between two brains. You've got your reptilian brain, fight or flight, um, and then you've got your higher level brain uh, that says, let's think about this. When we say how it is for us, we're keeping the conversation in that higher level brain. And so this is actually one of the strategies you use to keep from falling into that reptilian fight or flight is verbalization, because you're keeping that intellectual system working, and that is one of the principal tools of keeping that reptilian system at bay. So that's not complaining, and we're free to do that. You know, and when I first gave this presentation, um, somebody says, well, <laughs> You know, you've just cut me off. You know, I need I I figure things out when I'm talking. And if you say I can't say anything negative, it's not what we're talking about. And I think we know that difference. Now, what are the health impacts of frequent complainers? Now, this is not about being good or bad. Everybody complains, and it doesn't make you a bad person. But you may be killing yourself. Now, the study that my wife shared with me on the health impacts of of complaining is that folks who have studied this said, complaining happens about once a minute in a normal conversation. And so a lot of times we're not even realizing that we are complaining um, because it has become such a habit. And that's one of the, the big dangers. By the way, it rewires your brain. Now, um, there's been research done, and this is if you ever find yourself in my situation where you have to present something, the credibility benefits both as you, the speaker, and of your presentation, just go through the roof if your presentation includes a picture of the brain. Uh, so I, I've met that requirement, and I think I've got another one, so just to reinforce that. But it rewires your brain. Um, you know, they say what fires together kind of becomes that path, and so uh, it wires together. And so it becomes our default response. We don't even know we're doing it. Um, and so we, we actually have to have some interventions to find out. Now, if that's what all it was, that'd be no problem. But there's this little part of your brain called the hippocampus. And that's, in, that's important for things like learning, problem solving, intelligent thought. It's also one of the first areas of the brain impacted by Alzheimer's. Frequently complaining actually shrinks the size of your hippocampus, which kind of makes you stupid <laughs> over time. Um, and so that's another danger of just kind of getting into this. Um, it also releases cortisol, okay? And that's the, the, the nasty chemical that's associated with stress, uh, triggers the fight or flight, and it raises your blood pressure, your blood sugar. If you do it enough, it'll impair your immune system, make you more susceptible to high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and more vulnerable to strokes. So this is one of those things where it's worth it to kind of change a habit you may have just because it becomes so, um, so toxic to, to uh, be in a situation where you're a constant complainer. Now, there are some occupational hazards. For example, lawyers in law school, they teach you to find flaws in the other side's argument. Okay, And so that becomes kind of an expectancy set. That's how you view the world. If, if you're in law school or if you're a lawyer and, and your job is to basically find a flaw, to find a mistake. And that be can become overgeneralized to, to how you see the world. Now, that's also true with um, accountants. I'm taking much of the, the, the talk today from a book called The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. And if, if I don't talk too long, I've got a video of him. Um, and it's just a wonderful um, introduction to that whole why bother being positive, uh, why bother being happy in life. Um, but I think it's something we can also ask ourselves as healthcare folks. Do you spend at least part of your time looking at an x-ray or looking at a chart and just saying what's wrong? And that's a danger. And, and part, of, part of what you can do is once you become aware of the danger, you can realize that is part of something that's going on. I may need to do some things to get around that. And we'll talk about what those things are. But think about yourself as a healthcare professional. How much of the time, and it may vary by what you do, but how much of the time are you in this occupational hazard zone where I spend my whole day 
looking for the bad news. Um, with the accountants, um, when Sean Aker was working with one group of accountants, one of them admitted that he had created a spreadsheet of all of his wife's faults. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that was soon to be ex-wife or what, but um, you know, it, it just shows that you can get into that expectancy set. And I'm, I'm just cautioning if, if that is kind of what you're, you're finding in um, your life, that you come home and you just wonder why you know, everything is so negative. It may be uh, an occupational hazard that you're gonna have to work consciously to resist. So let's talk about the impacts of joy. Again, um, there's been 200 studies with over 275,000 folks in those studies that have identified these as being the impacts of joy in someone's life. You get greater success in marriage, health, friendship, community involvement, creativity, jobs, and careers. And as a worker, you have higher levels of productivity, sales, you're better leaders, higher performance ratings, higher pay, goes on and on and on. One of the points that if we see the Sean Acor video is we have it wrong. We think that happiness or joy is the reward for success. And he says the problem with that is it's always around the corner. Once we become happy, then we'll become successful. So this is just the impacts of joy. And you, know, you can ask the question, well, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it you know, people are happier because they are uh, successful or the other way around? Well, there's an interesting study that kind of um, puts things in the right order. Um, there's Sisters of Notre Dame, and this is like in the 1930s, they had all of the sisters when they're in their 20s write down these journals, um, their thoughts, and then they looked at them 50 years later. And they coded those journals that these um, nuns had written as, as 20-somethings in terms of how joyful they were as a 20-year-old. And what they found was that those who were the happiest lived 10 years longer. Okay, at 85, 90% of the happiest quartile was still alive, only 34% of the least happy quartile. Now, in some of these guys, I've actually got references. Don't worry about scribbling down references. They're all from Sean Acor's book, um, and I don't get commission, but uh, if, you, if you're passionate about this and want to learn more, um, it's probably the best read for that. Now, you wouldn't say that, well, they knew they are going to live long as a 20-year-old, and so that's why they're happier. So it's pretty clear that the, the relationship is that the happiness produces the results rather than being um, a function of those results. Now, the interesting thing is your beliefs can change your results. There was a, a study done where there's the cleaning staff at five hotels. And half of them are told, hey, by the way, what you do is a really great cardio workout. You know, when you're moving that vacuum, when you're moving this, you know, change it. That's really a workout. You, you're, you're getting paid to be at the gym. And so they told half the people that, and then they didn't tell anything the other half. The half they told, they lost weight and they lowered the cholesterol. I mean, go figure. Um, and so our beliefs can actually change the results we experience in our lives. And you know, you may argue that, well, yeah, uh, the people that knew they were getting exercise may have started to eat better. Great. You know, we're not saying this is the sole cause of that, but we do say it's a contributing cause to that. So just the whole idea that how we think can actually have some really dramatic results in some measurable things. Now, great study done, done here. They did a, a study where, and, and you guys know much more about this than I do, but apparently one of the things you do as a med student is you get this test where you get these symptoms and you have to kind of guess a diagnosis. And you know, and it's one of those things where you keep going, keep going, and then I think I've got the diagnosis, and then you, you say it. And one of the problems there is that anchoring can um, actually hurt you because you get a premature closure on, okay, I think it's, it's measles, okay? And so you're only looking for things to confirm that idea, and you miss, okay, so what they did was they put doctors in a happy state. These are actually experienced physicians in a happy state, and they took them back to that med school exercise of, we're gonna give you a list of symptoms, and then when you figure you've got figured out, just tell us what, what you think the disease is. And 
the happy doctors came up with a diagnosis twice as quickly, and they're two and a half times less likely to get stuck in anchoring. Now, that's pretty amazing in itself until you hear how they actually did the study. What did they do to make the doctors happy? They gave them a lollipop. They gave them candy. We weren't talking about trips to the Bahamas. We weren't talking about anything. Else. They gave them candy. And not only that, to control for blood sugar levels, they didn't let them eat the candy. But just, I mean, as, as funny and as amusing as that is, just think about the importance of that. The importance of being in a good state on your ability to do your job. You know, that, that somehow, if I'm able to cleanse out, you know, we all have stuff that happens to us, but if I'm able to cleanse that out and just get into a, a state of peace and happiness, I know when I, I do the job I do, um, I'm at least twice as productive if I'm kind of in that zone of happiness versus um, still being upset that, you know, we ran out of sugar pops for breakfast or whatever. Um, now, the other thing that's really important, and I think we ought to take this, this, these ideas, and obviously they apply to us, you know, that the change starts with us. So if, in fact, I'm thinking, oh, there's something going on in my life where I'm not as happy as I should be, we don't start by changing others, we start by changing us. But we do know that our feelings are contagious. And so what happens to us can impact more than just us. And in your case, your context, that also includes your patients. That the, the mood you have, you know, the, the approach you have, and um, is it Joe Pishoni? Pistoni? Pishoni. When he was here, he talked about he would pray, be, he, he was with someone who would pray between uh, visits in the hospital to just put himself in that positive, relaxed state. And now he did it for himself, but I think he also did it for the patient. You know, that just approaching someone as that relaxed, positive person, not bringing the last case into this case is huge. There's a reason for that. Um, it takes about 33 milliseconds for your amygdala to identify an emotion you see in someone else's face. Now this is a whole concept of mirror neurons where um, if you see someone smiling, uh, you'll smile too. My mother got kicked out of a movie theater for this uh, back in the days of silent movies uh, because she and her friends would go to the silent movies and they would suck lemons in front of the clarinet players. Uh, <laughs> which very quickly ruined the, the orchestra. And so they, they were asked to leave the, the movie theater. But that's, that's mirror neurons at work, that what we see takes about 33 milliseconds for us to kind of decode it, and then just about as quickly, our system starts replicating that. Okay, and that's the way in which our, our feelings, our emotions can be um, communicated to others. Now, there's also a conscious process, but this is just a hardwired, um, process and if I put three people in a room, whoever has the strongest affect, the strongest personality, it takes two minutes before the other two people in the room are also in that mood. Um, and so that, that to me says a couple things. You know, I, I had a, an employee one time who used to pout and um, I finally said to her, I said, I'm not gonna let your bad mood ruin my good mood. Uh, which of my way, even this is before all this, this stuff on neuroscience was even an interest of mine, but it was my way of saying, I'm gonna have the strongest personality here and I'm just gonna be in a good mood, you know, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna pout and, and ruin that for me. So that's important, but it's also important when you realize that, you know, you just came out of a meeting and you're feeling depressed, you may have been the victim of this communication. Now, how, how wide ranging is it? They're saying that you're contagious up to about three degrees, which means that your mood can affect your son's best friend's mother. And we probably all had that experience where there's somebody you, you interacted with at work, you came home and you shared it with a, a loved one, and then pretty soon someone comes to dinner and um, it also gets shared with them. So this is very, very powerful. And I guess, again, the importance of being mindful of our attitudes. 
And that three degrees for most people can be as wide ranging as a thousand people. Now, that works on both the good side and the bad. You know, if you really work at becoming a disciple of joy, that's a really powerful way of expanding that joyful environment. If you ignore the fact that you're not a disciple of joy and you have no interest in being a disciple of joy, that could be the damage that you're inflicting. Now, and sometimes, you know, if, if you're in a leadership position at your work, you have certain things you want to get done, but that joy is not there, you're actually making your people have to work harder to meet those, and many times they won't. In fact, there's some health benefits there. Our attitude can make others sick. Okay? If you have a bad boss, and this is, I think it was a 15-year study, employees with a difficult boss, they had a 30% increase in coronary heart disease. Uh, just the impact, that contagion of um, one attitude to another. Now, because it's so natural that we complain and we may not be aware of it, there's kind of a really interesting exercise we can do. Now, think of someone that you're in regular contact with and it's more than just kind of a, uh, did the Cubs win again relationship, and assess your last five conversations. Okay, and just think about that right now. My last five conversations with that person. How would I categorize that? Because that is a shorthand for categorizing the relationship. Now, I first learned about this about 15 years ago when I was doing, being trained as a business coach. And I came home and my daughter, who was 16 at the time, I said, Catherine, if I had to define my relationship with you by my last con five conversations, it'd be slave girl. Because the only time I talk to you is to tell you to do something. I said, I don't want that. Are you willing to work with me to change that? Now, I mean, she knew it in her heart. You know, the only, dad's coming, he must want me to do something. And it probably hurt a little bit that I actually said that out loud. But it was the beginning of a transformation of our relationship. Because if your relationship is your last five conversations, the way you change the relationship for most of us is to change the conversation. And that's something within our power to do. And that relates to the Lasada line. People research everything. The Lasada line is basically the ratio of kind of disruptive conversations to positive ones. And if you're not having at least a three to one positive to negative, you've lost the battle. Okay, so just think about it. Significant other spouse comes home with flowers. Okay, it can mean two things. What are the two things it can mean? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Okay, you said that too quickly. <laughs> What's the other thing it could mean? I love you. Yeah, just, just for nothing, I love you. And I just wanted to share that. Okay? The difference between you're in trouble, you've done something wrong, and I love you, and it's no, nothing special, I just wanted to say I love you, is the Lasada line. If, you're, if you drop below that three to one ratio of positive to negative conversations, you bring home the flowers and say, what did you do? If you're above that line, it's all thank you, sweetheart. You're so considerate. Okay, that's the way we work at home, that's the way we work in, in, in business, and that's the way you work in your offices, is if, those, if that, you're not having that balance of three to one. Now, what they say, like in domestic situations, probably better six to one. And I use that information, like if I had to have a tough conversation with a child, I would assess my last five conversations to decide if I had the strength to have that conversation. And if it wasn't urgent and I, don't felt, I didn't feel that I had that strength in the relationship to have the tough conversation, I would make sure I had at least two or three or four conversations that were positive before I addressed the hard issue. So that's one of the ways in which you can kind of get an assessment. If you're courageous enough, you can ask somebody else. Am I a complainer? You know, uh, my youngest daughter would be more than willing to spend some time with you and then give you a very honest answer. <laughs> but that's, that's really important that we, we get that assessment. 
Now, one of the things we also need to understand is that changing our world does not change our level of happiness. That 90%, and again, people research everything, 90% of where your, th your thermostat is set happens on the inside. And only 10% of those things in the world. And, and you see this in, in terms of um, folks who go through a tragedy. You know, and then within a couple months, their thermostat is reset to, to however happy or unhappy they are in general. Okay, and that's the way it'll remain unless you take some actions to uh, change it. And so I want to spend the next part of the, the talk talking about the 10 tips for getting more joy in your life. Okay. Uh, Carla is talking with you on the way in, right? Okay, attitude of gratitude. Um, <coughs> write down three good things every day for a week. Um, what happens when you do? What the research says, measurably you're, you're happier, less depressed. And the thing is, that's true at one month, three month, and six month follow-ups. Now, they don't need to be profound things. You don't need to give away your fortune. Um, but they need to be specific. Okay, so that's, that's got a staying power with it. Okay, provide, or um, if you journal positive things three times a week for 20 minutes, that also has um, spikes in happiness. And when they measured three months out from just that one week of journaling, um, there are fewer symptoms of illness. So that now, and this is one of the major ways in which if your job has got that occupational hazard of looking for the negative, this is the antidote. Because it trains your brain not only to look for the negative, which is what you need to do to do your job right, but it also trains your brain, balances your brain to look for the good things. Okay, and once you begin looking for the good things, you'll find them. Number two, conscious acts of kindness. Um, this is a study of over 2,000 people, uh, and the, the altruism decreases the stress and strongly contributes to, to mental health. And there are a couple studies there that, that look at that. Uh, just being kind to folks. Now, some of these things sound awful like the Sermon on the Mount, don't they? I mean, so that grace building on nature uh, these acts of kindness, the, the gratitude. Um, we find those embedded also in our faith. This one's probably not in our faith, um, except for anticipating heaven. Uh, but positive anticipation. Uh, the reason I have Netflix up here is the actual study. Um, people who just thought about watching their favorite movie, uh, they raised their endorphin levels by 27%. So anticipating and... and there are people who, um, the anticipation of vacation, the planning for vacation is as pleasurable as the vacation itself. And that's this phenomenon that we can kind of train our brains to, to say good things are coming. This one's a little bit more difficult to explain. Um, and that is a change your explanatory style. Because there's a real difference between what happens and what we make it mean. So let's just say, there are 50 people in a bank, you're in the bank, bank robbers come in, one shot is fired, you get hit in the arm. Okay. How would you honestly explain that the next day? Well, this is something that Sean Acor asked people. And about 70% list, say the next day, just what bad luck it was or just how unfortunate it was for them that they got hit. In fact, if he's working with Wall Street people, he usually gets the comment, there must have been somebody in the bank more deserving of getting hit than me. <laughs> Which may be not true if that's their attitude. But there are about 30% of the people who say, you know what, I'm grateful. Of all the people in the bank, it could have hit a child, it only hit my arm, I'm gonna recover. It really is a blessing. And that ability to realize that what happened was, a, Somebody robbed a bank, you got hit. That's the fact. But there's what's called counterfactuals, which are the alternative that you invent, and invent is the right word. There's the alternatives that you invent that puts what happens in context. 
And if we can learn to actually have positive counterfactuals, we'll be happier people. Okay, and so that's kind of this whole idea of your explanatory style. Something happened, what am I gonna make it mean? If I can make it mean something positive, then I'm gonna be much more positive as a person. Okay, and they tend to look at bad things as being local and temporary. People that have an explanatory style that's negative, this is just another example that is never gonna work. Okay, we control both of those. They're both things that our mind invents to help us put our experiences in context. There's an ABCD method to do that. One is you experience adversity. Second is, what is our belief about what that means? What are the consequences of what we're believing? And do we need to dispute that? Okay, and so if you're struggling with that, um, again, Sean Acor's book has great things uh, that he can tell you and give you some help in terms of getting around that. Now, the next one is something we all know, exercise. Uh, they did a study, uh, they had three conditions. One got antidepressant medicine, one got medicine and exercise alone, and medicine and exercise, and then the third condition was exercise alone. Now, during the treatment phase, they experienced equal levels of improvement. But after four, after, after four months of treatment, but a six month follow up, there's a 38% relapse with the medicine and the medicine and exercise. There's only a 9% relapse rate for the exercise only group. And so just, you know, now, Acorn in his book makes a point, we know this stuff, but sometimes we don't follow through on it. Um, but we know that that's one of the, the ways in which we can improve um, our experience of joy in the world. Next one is something that we, if we think about it, we know. Invest in experience in others as opposed to investing in things. I mean, how many of you have ever gotten that dream toy and two months later it's in the closet? You know, it's like, well, I just thought I wanted it so badly, okay? Again, we research everything. Experiences, investing in experiences rather than things will make you happier. And a corollary to that is spending money on others rather than yourself is what really promotes happiness. Infusing productivity or positivity in your environment is another tip. Now, 10 tips, do you have to do them all? No. Some may be easier to do, they may get you momentum to doing others, but there should be something here that everybody, if they're, they're saying, I wish I was more positive, I wish I was more joyful, there should be something here for everyone. Okay, so positivity in your environment. Um, even walking outside for 20 minutes a day when the weather's good uh, boosts pro uh, the positive mood, it broadens thinking, and it improves your working memory. Um, other things you can do for that positivity is have an uncluttered work environment, which I fail at miserably, uh, but I can tell you about it. And you know, putting things that mean something to you, whether it's pictures of of vacations, pictures of loved ones, um, whatever, to kind of create that positivity in your environment. Next one's kind of interesting. Exercise a signature strength. We're all good at something. And it may or may not be what we do for a living. And many times, in fact, I was with somebody this week and they talked about how much they like to play guitar and how long it had been since they'd played. And it was kind of like one of these, I wish I could get back to it. Well, you know, was it uh, Yoda that said there is no try? <laughs> you just do it or don't. Um, the power of exercising a signature strength, and part of that is you have to figure out, you know, what is my signature strength? You know, is it, is it consoling family? Is it playing a musical instrument? Whatever it is. Because they did a study, and, and what they did was they had 577 volunteers encouraged to use a signature strength in a new way each day for one week. And they were significantly happier and less depressed. And again, the ability to make change that's, that's longer lasting than just today, that change was still measurable six months later. So, I mean, this may be the time you dust out that old violin and remember how 
how much you enjoyed playing it as a kid, and just do that for yourself and for your mental health. Probably one of the most important ones is nurturing relationships. That's why I gave the commercial for Fathers of St. Joseph, and that's why I'll give a commercial for this organization. What I'm doing here now may not be as important as what happened for the 10 minutes before the talk started in terms of making connections, renewing connections, and nurturing relationships. Now, the, the Harvard Men's Study looked at uh, 268 men starting in 1930 and continuing to the present. And what they found was love equals happiness, or happiness equals love. That, that is the, the most powerful predictor. And then the uh, second study was done, and they said that um, there's only one characteristic that distinguished the happiest 10% from the rest, and that was the strength of their social relationships. What does that mean to you as a, a medical professional in terms of not only your work relationships, but also your relationships with your patients? In preparing this, I, I talked to Tim and I said, do you pray with your, your folks, your, your patients? And um, he said, sometimes I do. You know, and that could be a question each of us asks. You know, obviously, you don't want to step over bounds, but it's amazing um, the degree to which we think there's a boundary that somebody's more than willing to let us cross. And um, one of my brother deacons gave a homily one time and said, the five most powerful words is, may I pray with you? And they're going to say yes, they're going to say no, and either way you go on. But that power, uh, I can remember the birth of our first daughter. Um, Dr. Keller was over in Davenport. I don't know if anybody remembers him. Um, and um, it was our third child, and I was ready. I had gone through two childbirths, so I kind of felt myself a pro. So I brought these um, cassette tapes in, glory and praise, to kind of relax my wife, Marianne, as we went through the birth process. We didn't know that, that Dr. Keller was in the choir over in Damport. So he's got his arms folded, sitting at the, his position. Peace is flowing. You know, and my wife looks down, are you going to catch this thing when it comes out? <laughs> <laughs> but just to have the doctor, to have that medical professor, enter into our world of spirit, our world of faith, was huge. I mean, that, that is still probably the, the birth experience that we say, this is, this is what every birth ought to be. Okay? And so we can talk about, you know, whether that relationship includes, and we'll talk a little bit more about prayer later, but, but entering into an authentic relationship. Now, there's a special power here in terms of relationships for healing. Okay? We may see this in some of the people we serve. Lack of social contact can add 30 points to an adult's uh, blood pressure reading. Um, that isolation, you know, that may be more therapeutic to kind of address that than whatever the presenting sim symptoms are. Um, they did a study. Participating in a breast cancer support group doubled a woman's life expectancy post-surgery. Uh, just again, that that nurturing of those social relationships. People who receive emotional support during the six months following a heart attack were three times as likely to survive. Okay, we're just seeing all this evidence that kind of, it's not just a nice to do, it's a need to do. And research says that social support has a, as much effect on life expectancy as smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, and regular physical activity. Our last one may, may be, to me, the most important one, and that is prayer and meditation. And um, prayer and meditation actually can rewire your brain. We talked about how we get in these patterns, and prayer and meditation is one of the ways in which can, we can rewire our brains. And let me give a third commercial here, and that is for our Adoration Chapel. I've seen many of the people I see here, I've seen at the chapel, and that is huge. Um, because that fills you up, you know, they, that gives you something you can then give to others. So we, it starts with us, 
but it, it can go well beyond us. Now, interesting study done on prayer and pain. And here's my second brain picture. So in case you're wondering, uh, I've met the requirement for being a really credible presenter. Um, they did a study and the, um, it was done at Oxford by the Department of Clinical Neurology. They had 24 people, 12 more Catholic, 12 more atheist. And what they did was um, they put them in an MRI and gave them an electric shock. And they were either looking at kind of a generic picture drawn around the same time or the picture of the Virgin Mary. And what they found was, and, and what, that's what the, the second visual is, for only those people who were both Catholic and looking at the picture of Mary, did the brain center light that's responsible for suppressing pain. And so this whole idea of our role as, as healthcare professionals in terms of what we do with um, our patients, treating them holistically, understanding that for those of our patients or those of the people who are in our practices uh, who have a life of faith, anything we can do to support it is actually you know, providing tremendous care to them. I want to leave you with something kind of practical, and that's declaratory prayer. Does anybody remember um, the Veggie Tales um, about Jonah? Okay, they, they had this worm and um, Cahil, and um, he would put on these, you can see the earphones, he'd put on these earphones and it would say, you know, you are the be most beautiful, you're the brightest, you're the best carpet salesman the world has ever known. All these self-affirmations. Well, declaratory prayer is nothing like that, okay? And I owe this to um, Father Charles uh, in a presentation that, that he gave to us. Declaratory prayer is something way, way different from that. It's not what I say about myself it is what God has told us about ourselves. And so we have the choice to either believe what God has told us about ourselves or not. But we know we've got a God who is good and true and honest and love and, and all those things. And so declaratory prayer is just making part of us what God has told us is already true of us. So what are some examples of declaratory prayer? In Jesus, I'm 100% loved and worthy to experience all God's blessings. Straight from the Bible. We can pray that prayer until we know that in our hearts. My prayers are powerful and effective. I set the course of life with my words. Now, as you walked in, there's a little card, a little business size card. One, one side kind of talks about what the, the declaration, the declaratory prayers are. The other, we've got some examples of declaratory prayers. And so my invitation to you is just kind of one thing you can take away and begin doing without having to remember anything else I've said today, is to look at those, see if one resonates, and begin praying it. For those of you who are really in for the, uh, the workout, and again, I, I owe this to Father Charles, um, We've got a whole sheet of declarations over on the table where you can pray these declarations. You can find one that resonates with you where you are in your life and pray those. So I want to wrap up by just talking about the, the importance of joy in our lives. That um, when we become beacons of joy, we can change the whole world. Now, I lost complete track of time. Do I have time to show a 12-minute video or no? Okay. So I'm going to switch gears here, and um, I've been talking about it. Sean Acor has actually lived this uh, positive psychology stuff. He's one of the, the leaders in the field. It's going to take me about two seconds to switch the computer and, and wake up the sound system, and um, we'll end the morning with a laugh. I will, I will take questions, but not give answers. No. <laughs> I, heard a, I heard a presentation where, at the end, he says, we'll have questions and attempted answers. Um, I really would much more like to facilitate a dialogue if there are any questions or experiences or things that you as actually people doing it can say, yeah, this worked for me. But let's watch this 12 minutes and then if you want to stick around and, and have that, we'll do that.